Dear friends, I am so sorry I cannot be with you for this very special event. For those of us blessed to be part of this extraordinary and challenging thing called theological education, we know that we have lived in and through some very complicated times. But the person you will hear from tonight has taken on challenges that few of us can even imagine. I know of no leader in almost any walk of life who has led with the courage, industry, honesty, and integrity to borrow from a Reinhold neighbor prayer of our very special guest, Dr. George Sabra. Dr. Sabra, on behalf of all of us here at McCormick and our World Mission Institute partners, I offer our warmest welcome and our deepest gratitude for your leadership, your friendship, and your faithful witness. May God bless you and continue to bless the Near East School of Theology in Beirut. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ted Hebert. I'm Professor Emeritus now of Old Testament at McCormick Seminary and stepping in briefly for President Crawford, who was not able to be here this evening. So first of all, I want to welcome those of you who are present uh, and who have braved the coronavirus and the snow to be here in person. You're a faithful bunch. Uh, I also want to welcome the great cloud of witnesses that are joining us remotely. I hear it's a big number and uh, all of you are uh, very welcome as we uh, gather together for the 2022 World Mission Institute to hear Dr. George Sabra. In a moment, I want to ask Rob Worley to come up to give Dr. Sabra a proper introduction, but I wanna take this opportunity to just say a couple of words of welcome to George. A couple of years ago, I was um, invited to come to the Near East School of Theog Theology in Beirut to give lectures. And I wanna just uh, express my thanks and gratitude for the hospitality of that community. Uh, Dr. Sabra and the community at Nest are truly one of my favorite theological communities in the entire world. We talk about multiculturalism at McCormick a lot, but uh, when you're there, that's a whole other level of multiculturalism. Students from Beirut, Lebanon, from Syria, from Iraq, Iran, Jordan, Palestine, even East Africa. It's a, an amazing community, friendly, hospitable, and inspiring. I also wanna remark as did David Crawford on the courage of Dr. Sabra and his community in, in the last 20, 30 years, uh, living through 15 years of civil war, living through the recent massive explosion in the harbor, which significantly damaged the seminary. And now, as George will say in a few minutes, negotiating life in a failing state. It's a set of challenges for theological education and for the church that a few of us in the United States can even imagine. And I admire and celebrate his courage. So I wanna personally, George, welcome you uh, and say how thankful we are for you to make the big trip over here to join us and to share your experiences with us. And now I'll ask Rob to come up and introduce our speaker. Thank you all for joining us here in afar this evening to hear Dr. Sabra. Um, it's a pleasure to offer my own welcome to Dr. Sabra on behalf of the Chicago Committee for Global Mission, um, the group of faculty from LSTC, CTU, and McCormick who organize and sponsor this event every year. Um, I've known George since the mid 1990s when McCormick partnered with the Near East School of Theology in an STM program taught with the collaboration of several McCormick faculty, among them David Daniels, who's present tonight. 
Um, today, in these days, we have been overwhelmed by and worried by events in Ukraine. Tonight, Dr. Sauber will remind us of a deepening catastrophe in his own home and country, Lebanon. Dr. Sauber was born in Beirut. He received his Bachelor of Philosophy from the American University, Beirut, then his Master of Divinity from Princeton and a Master of Arts in Medieval Studies from the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies um, at the University of Toronto. In 1986, he was awarded the Doctorate of Theology from the Faculty of Theology in the University of Tuben in Germany. In 1987, Dr. Sabra joined the faculty at the Neary School of Theology, where he has taught systematic theology, has served as academic dean and president since 2012. He has also been a lecturer at the American University and at other Lebanese universities. In addition, he served on several international dialogue committees representing the Reformed Churches in the Middle East in the World Alliance of Reformed Churches, the Oriental Orthodox Churches Dialogue Commission. He was also a member of the International Theological Dialogue Committee between the World Communion of Reformed Churches and the Catholic Church. Dr. Sabra also represents the Neary School of Theology in an association of Christian and Islamic seminaries and faculties of theology and religion called the Encounter of Christian and Muslim Religious Colleges and Institutes in Lebanon. In addition, Dr. Saber is the editor of the Theological Review, author, editor, and translator of several books and articles in the fields of theology, ecumenism, Middle Eastern Christianity, and Christian-Muslim dialogue. Thank you, Dr. Sabra, George, our friend, for taking your valuable time to make this long journey to be with us personally, to share your story, your community's story, and the story of Lebanon and Syria. We are immensely grateful. Thank you very much for your uh, kind words of introduction to President uh, David Crawford, my friend Ted uh, Heber. I'm very happy to be with you and I thank the Chicago Committee um, for Global Mission for inviting me to this um, lecture. And I bring you greetings from the Near East School of Theology. My topic, uh, Mission in a Collapsing State the church and theological uh, education in Lebanon uh, today. Um, about a century and a half ago, in 1869, when the first Protestant theological seminary was established by the American Protestant mission in Mount Lebanon, It was established by the American uh, Presbyterian Mission. Lebanon was neither a nation nor a state. 50 years later in 1920, the modern nation state of Lebanon was proclaimed and gained international recognition. Today, Lebanon is a divided nation and a failing state. The Near East School of Theology of 2022 which is the successor of the first Protestant seminary, finds itself in similar, somewhat similar conditions as its parent institution in 1869. The 19th century seminary was founded in the aftermath of a civil war, that of 1860 between the Christians and the Druze mainly, and which resulted in the destruction and burning of tens of towns and villages displacement of tens of thousands of people, severe social and economic consequences, intervention of foreign political powers, and large-scale immigration, especially in the 1890s. The seminary today, like the country of Lebanon as a whole, 
is still living in the shadow of the Lebanese war of 1975-90, to 90, which has resulted also in hundreds of thousands of deaths, destruction of towns and villages, destruction of infrastructure, internal displacement of peoples, intervention of foreign re regional power, and massive immigration. My talk today is not historical, and I do not intend to carry further the comparison between then and now, or to dwell on it, but I mention this to say two things. What we are going through today is not totally new in our history. We have been through more than one similar situation, but, and this is the second thing, there is no guarantee that because we have been through something similar, survived and continued our mission, that we will survive the current crisis. To survive and continue, of course, is our hope and prayer, but history does not just repeat itself. It may well be that the current crisis that Lebanon is passing through is the worst in its history so far, and it might change the country in very radical and unexpected ways, and with it, our churches and our theological education. So where are we today in Lebanon? One of the very few positive things about the severe crisis that we are experiencing in Lebanon is that we have had to expand our vocabulary and learn new concepts in political thought as well as in economic and financial theories. Apparently, there is such a thing as a failed state, a fragile state, and a state collapse. And it's not always clear what the subtle distinctions between these are. But it seems to me, though I'm definitely no political scientist, that many of the characteristics of these apply to the state in Lebanon today. It may be a bit too rash to affirm with certainty at this point that Lebanon is a failed state, or that the state has completely collapsed, but it is undoubtedly true that Lebanon is a failing or a collapsing state. If the overall status of a country is determined by assessing internal cohesion and economic, and political, social, and external relation factors, then Lebanon is definitely a failing state. Internal cohesion is weak and fragmented because of factionalization and sectarianism. Economically, there is decline, nay, a collapse, and there is consequently human flight and brain drain, immigration. Politically, the legitimacy of the ruling class is strongly contested and is highly suspect. Public services are at an all-time low. Human rights and rule of law are, best, are at best selective, and corruption is rampant. Socially, there is the great pressure of Syrian refugees, about 1.5 million, and about 400,000 Palestinian refugees in a country of 5.5 million. And in terms of external relations, there is external political intervention from many countries in the region and the state displays lack of sovereignty, for it cannot exercise authority over its territory or its people completely. And it cannot control its borders. There are open and uncontrolled borders for smuggling people, goods, drugs with Syria. And there is factual control of the southern border with Israel by a militia called Hezbollah despite the presence of UN forces and the symbolic presence of the Lebanese army. The situation of being a failing state has resulted in the devaluation of the Lebanese pound by 90%. The Lebanese pound is pegged to the dollar, to the US dollar. The dollar used to be 1,500 pounds, Lebanese pounds, for over 25 years, Today, one dollar is worth 23,000 Lebanese pounds. The financial and banking systems have broken down. People cannot access their savings. 
Unemployment in the country is around 41.4%. That's at the end of 2021. Electricity blackout is 21 hours a day. We have the highest race, rate of inflation in the world, 137.8%. 30% of workers and employees were laid off. 82% of the population suffer from multidimensional poverty. The minimum wage is now worth $22 per month used to be $450 a couple of years ago. Medications, gasoline, fuel of all kinds, cooking gas are either scarce or exorbitantly expensive. I could go on and on, but I think it is clear that the situation is very dire. And the Ukraine war, Russian-Ukraine war, is making th life even harder in Lebanon because we import 60% of our wheat from the Ukraine and a lot of oil, and these have stopped. Daily life for the ordinary Lebanese has become extremely difficult. There is despair everywhere. The rate of suicide has been rising. The World Bank declared recently that Lebanon faces today one of the world's three worst economic crises in the last 150 years. There are economic and financial reasons for the crisis. There is corruption, mismanagement, bad governance, and bad policies, etc., that have been going on for decades. But many believe, and I am among them, that essentially Lebanon's problem is political. The collapse of the state is a result of the breakdown of the nation. The breakdown of the nation is due to, to external and internal factors. A country like Lebanon with major unsolved internal political problems and which exists in a region of the world where regional and international powers are continually at odds with each other, where there is struggle for power and domination all the time, Trying to get to the next slide, yes. Struggle for power and domination all the time. For example, the Saudi-Iranian struggle, the Turkish search for a superpower in the region, superpower role, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the civil war in Syria, the Russian-American vying for power and influence in the region, the instability in Iraq, the war in Yemen, all these affect Lebanon, and some of them tear it apart internally. And the ground is fertile in Lebanon because the various religious communities that make up the country never really agreed or came to a consensus on what it means to be Lebanese. At present, the most powerful political power in the country is a political, military, and religious party with pro-Iranian Islamic Shiite ideology, for whom Lebanon and the interest of Lebanon do not come first. Rather, allegiance to Iran and its religious and political ideology and interests in the region comes first. And this powerful political and military force constitutes something like a state within a state and runs an army parallel to the Lebanese army and has its own foreign policy and intervenes in wars and conflicts in the region without the uh, consent of the constitutional institutions of the country that represent the majority of the population. It has its own banking system and social and educational and medical institutions and services. This powerful pro-Iranian political and military power, a militia, is one of the main reasons, but not the only one, 
why the popular uprising of October 17, 2019 against the corrupt ruling class could not achieve any tangible results. The pro-Iranian party defends the interests of the corrupt ruling class. Thus, it has been basically against the popular protests, despite rhetoric to the contrary, and at many points even attacked and suppressed the protesters physically. The irony here, and I've said this more than once before, is that popular support for this militant political party and its allies comes from a segment of the population that is overwhelmingly poor and suffering under the same economic collapse and governmental corruption like other Lebanese. But what really motivated them to stand in the face of the uprising against the ruling class was their religious and confessional identity or affiliation, not their socioeconomic situation. You have here a most vivid refutation of Marxist philosophy and anthropology. Not the socioeconomic material conditions of human beings are the ultimate determinative factors in individual and collective human life, but the religious factor. The role of religion and religious passion is central here. And this is something I want to come back to at later. Important to keep in mind now is that this powerful political and military power in Lebanon actually controls the country and the government of Lebanon today. Nothing can take place if this political and military party is opposed to it. Add to all this, the political, uh, to this political mess, the purely economic and financial mismanagement, corruption and bad governance, as well as the impact of COVID-19 and the port explosion of 2020, all of these affect aspects, all aspects of the country, and you have the complete picture of the failing state of Lebanon. It is in this situation that our churches and our theological seminary exist today. The economic collapse of Lebanon and the grave financial and monetary crisis have severely impacted the churches, church institutions, and individuals who work there. Salaries, life savings, end of service compensation, retirement funds, local income, etc., are all of a sudden worth nothing, almost nothing. People and institutions are literally involved in a daily struggle for subsistence. This means that the foremost concern of our churches and their institutions is now that of survival. The simplest and most vital daily needs and requirements for existence have to be struggled for. Ability to purchase food, water, medications, electricity, gasoline, diesel oil, just to mention the most basic. How are people coping? A great majority is not coping and their situation is absolutely dire. But those who are somehow able to cope, and among them our churches and church institutions, can do so because they are receiving outside financial help. Only if you have access to hard currency from abroad, in some form or another, in one way or another, through family or friends or institutions, churches or NGOs, are you able to cope relatively speaking, of course. And this is exactly where our churches and our seminary are today. Financial or material support and donations from abroad enable them to continue and also to help others. So the churches have become to a great extent agents of material and financial support to their members and also to society at large. The humanitarian task is the main activity of the churches and their institutions. And for this, they are completely dependent, as I said, on aid from outside Lebanon, specifically from the West. A lot is being done, and this is not the place to report about those activities. Survival and the humanitarian role seem now to have become the main mission of the churches. 
Now, survival as such is not and can never be the mission of the churches. But equally true is that survival is necessary if there is to be a mission at all. You have to be there in order to have a mission. And being there is very much at stake in Lebanon today. I do not want at all to belittle the uh, quest for mere survival. Yet that in itself is not the mission of the church. To fulfill a humanitarian role is no doubt an essential aspect of being a Christian and a church, but that cannot be the whole mission. The church cannot simply become an NGO, even though it is perhaps the oldest continuously existing <clears throat> NGO in the world. There's a real danger in Lebanon and the Middle East today for the Christians and the churches and their institutions to become wholly obsessed with survival and or totally engulfed by the humanitarian task as to think, believe and act as though this comprised their full and sufficient mission. Beyond the humanitarian role, there is a mission There is a mission for the churches and Christians in Lebanon and the region as a whole. But I highlight here the role of Christians and churches of Lebanon, especially. Not because I'm Lebanese, but because in spite of its failing state these days, Lebanon, with its firmly rooted Christian population and history, is especially positioned to undertake and lead this mission. Lebanon is not a Christian country as such, but it is the only country in the region that was founded by Christian will and effort, and where Christians were the majority at one point and are still a major influence in society, politics, and culture, where you have the freest Christian communities in the Middle East. It's the only country in the region whose president is a Christian, and the only country in the region with the highest ratio of Christians to Muslims and also the only country in the region where Christians coexist with Sunnis and Shiites on an equal basis, one third each, and in full equality before the law. And it is the country which has the freest and most vital dialogue between Christians and Muslims in the Middle East. Despite the fact that the Lebanese state is collapsing, and on the verge of becoming a totally failed state. The churches and Christians of Lebanon can and should still undertake a mission in the country itself and in the region, assuming, of course, that they are able to survive and cope with the present economic and financial crisis, political crisis. Besides the mission of every church to proclaim the gospel of love, forgiveness, abundant life, and peace in any context and in every period of history, there is a special mission or rather a specific concretization of the gospel in the context of the Middle East. What is the context of the Middle East? What comes to people's minds when the Middle East is mentioned? No doubt most people think of the Arab-Israeli or Palestinian conflict. They think of the battle for control of oil and its sources, of the struggle for power and influence between regional powers and states, as well as between international ones, the USA and Russia. The context is usually analyzed, understood, explained in terms of politics, economics, and sociology. But to stop here is to miss the heart of what makes the Middle East what it is and what it has been for centuries, nay, millennia. Unless religion and religious passion and commitment, religious pathos are seen as a major constituent of the, of the realities of the Middle East, of human beings and communities there, one is missing a major part of the picture. There is a tendency, in fact, it has been a dominant tendency for decades now, especially on the part of some Western historians and political scientists, 
to explain away religion as simply an epiphenomenon of the more basic and really constitutive political, economic, and social and psychological factors. I believe this has been behind many mistakes and miscalculations of Western political policies and faulty analysis of the problems of the Middle East. Religion is a primary factor in the shaping of peoples and events. The genius of the Middle East, wrote one Lebanese intellectual and diplomat over 50 years ago, is religion. Allow me to quote the Lebanese philosopher and diplomat Charles Malik in full in this rather literary paragraph, but which I believe is very uh, true and perceptive. He wrote back in the 1950s, the peoples of these lands, the Near East, did not create in science and philosophy, in the arts of beauty and the arts of self-government. The greatest science, the greatest philosophy, the greatest art, the greatest forms of government matured elsewhere. And nobody comes to the Near East to study them and bask in their splendor. Insofar as there is a special economy among the peoples in the creations of the spirit, the Near East is not gifted along these lines. Shabby and unworthy as the Near East may be in these earthly human achievements, it has been reserved to it to storm the heaven itself and open its doors. If it did not create in science and philosophy and the arts, it has been granted, if I may say without blasphemy, to create God. Or more correctly, God has chosen to reveal himself in it. And therefore to create it as well as its history through the suffering and trials of its people. The Middle East and all its problems and challenges that it creates and that it faces are not understood properly if God and religion are not seen as central and decisive. To analyze the causes of problems and challenges and to suggest solutions that rely merely on political, social, and economic factors and components is to miss the whole point. Of course, all these dimensions are necessary and important the political, the sociological, the economic, the psychological, etc. But without the central religious component, you have not understood the Middle East. The religious reality of the Middle East tells us that the future of the region, and therefore the future of Christians and churches in that region, is inextricably linked with the future of Islam. The future is on Islam's terms. Islam is the religion of the overwhelming majority. And it's not just a religion in the narrow sense of the word, namely spiritual precepts and worship instructions and relation to God of the soul and the community. Islam is a total outlook on life, which includes the spiritual, the political, the cultural, the social, and even the economic aspects of life. Islam, whether it's in, it's in its Arab, Persian or Turkish versions is a total outlook that shapes all aspects of people's lives. The future of the region depends on the future of Islam in its different forms. This is not new, for it has been the case for centuries. But it is again very clear. It is at its clearest and most manifest today because there is an Islamic religious re resurgence in the region. When reflecting and considering, reflecting on and considering the mission of Christians and churches, we must have this reality clearly before us. What is the mission of Christians in a world where Islam determines the future? Obviously, the answer depends on what we can say or anticipate about the future of Islam. Where is Islam going? Where to Islam? I realize full well that Islam is not one uniform phenomenon today, that there is a pluralism in Islam, that Muslim societies and countries are not all identical. But no one can deny that Islam is the umbrella under which the whole Middle East has been living for the last 14 centuries, and that today in the 21st century, a revived Islam in one form or another 
is gaining political ground in many countries and societies, especially in those countries that have undergone transformations and changes. So whither, where to Islam today in the Middle East? That is really the question. The future of Islam in the region is not yet clear. Where to Islam is not yet visible. But what is clear is that there is at present a twofold battle over Islam in the region today, which is not only affecting the Middle East, but also the rest of the world. There is a battle, a twofold battle. There is a battle over the body of Islam and a battle over the soul of Islam, if you allow me to use this somewhat outdated analogy in theological thought of body and soul. The battle over the body of Islam is manifest in the inter-Islamic political, military, and economic struggle in the Middle East. A struggle for power between states and political and militant groupings into which non-Muslim states and powers are drawn and which they exploit. It is evident in the rivalry and polarization between Iran and Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries, in the ambitions of Turkey and Iran to be the superpowers of the region, in the projects of militant and extremist organizations and groups such as Al-Qaeda and its descendants like ISIS, the Muslim Brotherhood, and all that falls under militant political Islam. There is a struggle for power, for control of states and territories. It's a struggle between Sunnis and Shi'is, but also among Sunnis themselves. This is still going on. And it is apparent, for example, in the civil war in Syria, in Iraq, in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, in Bahrain itself, in the war in Yemen, in Egypt, in the political tensions in Lebanon, and among the Palestinians themselves between Hamas, for example, and the Palestinian Authority. The battle for the soul of Islam, on the other hand, is of a spiritual, theological, intellectual, and cultural nature. It is between conservative, fundamentalist, political Islam on the one side, and reformist, revisionist, renewed or transformed Islam on the other. And I will say more about this presently. In light of this, what can we say about the witness of Christians and churches and about their mission? To begin with, Christian communities and churches in the region cannot get directly involved in the battle over the body of Islam. To be sure, Christians as communities and as individuals suffer great collateral damage because of the inter-Islamic battles. But Christians have no role there as Christian communities. There are no Christian states in the region, and churches are not political parties. Their role and witness are not directly in the political arena of the struggle for power and the struggle over what I call the body of Islam. Christians are definitely adversely affected by the struggle, but they have no role as churches. All that Christians and churches can do as the battles over the body of Islam rage around them is somehow to manage to remain and persevere. But Christians in the Middle East cannot remain and persevere without the understanding and support of the worldwide Christian communities and churches. It would not be too difficult to demonstrate, though we don't have time for it here tonight, that historically the Christians of the Middle East have never been unrelated to Christian churches and institutions outside the region, and that notwithstanding some negative effects of that relationship, much good and many benefits have accrued to Middle Eastern Christians as a result of the relationship with entities beyond the region, ecclesiastically, spiritually, theologically, socially, educationally, culturally, and materially. The same remains true today. Christians in the Middle East today cannot remain and persevere alone without the partnership and support of our sisters and brothers worldwide. 
but the mission of the Christians in that region of the world has to do with their ability and willingness to participate in the battle over the soul of Islam. Christians cannot and should not take part in the battle of the, over the body of Islam, as I said. We have no role there. We have no business there. We have no mission there. But we ought to be able to participate in the battle over the soul of Islam. But with Muslims, not against them, with their consent, not in spite of them, and with genuine concern for the future of Islam and therefore our future. The events which have occurred in the Islamic world of the Middle East since the last <clears throat> two decades of the 20th century, beginning with the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979, <clears throat> the assassination of President Sadat by militant jihadis in 1981, the participation of the jihadis in the fight to oust the Soviet Union from Afghanistan, which led to the rise of bin Laden, up until ISIS and all that took place in between, all these developments which have ushered in a resurgence of militant and repressive forms of Islam have gradually alarmed many Muslim thinkers and some religious leaders to the need for a radical critique of these developments and for a reconstruction of a new Islamic religious and cultural narrative to quote the words of Radwan al Sayyid, professor, he is a professor and sheikh, a prominent Lebanese Muslim Sunni scholar, well respected in many parts of the Islamic world, calls for precisely this critical and radical campaign to build a new religious and cultural narrative on three bases, which he elaborated in a lecture held at our seminary nest a couple of years ago. I'll just mention the three points he mentioned. Regaining religious, first point, regaining, of, of, uh, sorry, regaining religious tranquility by abandoning that deadly duality of Islam as both a religion and a political state. Two, renewal of the experiment of the national state the state of good governance in order to pull away the youth from the illusions of a religious state. And three, correcting the relation of Islam to the world by not treading the road of terrorizing the world or being afraid of it, but by hoping and working to enter into its order and interact, interact with its norms and rules so as to safeguard Islamic stability and its interests as nations and peoples and states who are a positive and constructive part of the world order. I mention this not in order to go into details of a current discussion in Islam, but to highlight that in that very lecture, Professor Sayyid said that in order to achieve these three things, Muslims need the cooperation and the experience of their fellow Christians. For they have been, he said, they have been through this and are still going through it. And this is not uh, just a lone voice that, that we hear, although such voices are not always heard loudly. In this regard, I would like to mention a very interesting lecture that was given by a Lebanese Shiite journalist and intellectual in the Kingdom of Bahrain in 2019. and was entitled, Beyond Fundamentalist Islam, the Reforming Role of Islam, of the West. Jihad al-Zain expressed his disappointment that a whole century of attempted reforms in the Middle Eastern Arab Islam have failed, which has led to a profound crisis. None of those attempts was able to stop the onward march of fundamentalist Sunni and Shiite Islam, he said. Therefore, he says, it is a legitimate, practical, and effective project to look to the Muslims of the West, those who are living in Western countries and under Western civilization in hope for reform and renewal. The Islamic East has, has exhausted itself and it cannot achieve the requisite change. And I quote from him, 
the liberating oxygen comes today from the Western academic experience. Will the Muslim elites who are involved in Western culture be able to lift Islam out of its present crisis? That, for him, is the decisive question today. And here is a possible role for Christians in the West to participate along with their Muslim compatriots in this project of reform and renewal. But again, for the Christians of the West, along with their Muslim compatriots, in this project of reform and renewal, but again with Muslims, not against them, with their consent, not in spite of them. The call, there are calls for renewal and the representation among some Muslim leaders and thinkers. The term reform may not be acceptable to most Muslim thinkers and leaders today, though some do not shy away from it. The need for self-examination and self-criticism, acceptance of the other as other, recognition of pluralism, equality and freedom of belief and conscience, and the separation of religion and state, these are the heart of the matter. Thus, all efforts working towards those goals contribute to the change in the spiritual climate of the region. What we witnessed in the Arab Emirates, United Arab Emirates, three years ago last February, the encounter between Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar in the presence of a host of Christian and Islamic leaders and the declaration of a joint statement on human fraternity for world peace and living together is precisely what is needed. That encounter and the declaration that it produced are an example, an excellent illustration of the kind of Christian participation with Islam on the journey of spiritual renewal in the Middle East, as well as the rest of the world. This is not the place for going through that document in detail, but suffice it to say that in its form and content, it provides grounds for hope if it is heeded and followed up. It was not simply a major Christian leader and a major Islamic leader coming together to speak about and to Muslims and Christians, about Christian-Muslim relations. It was a statement by high-ranking officials in those two religions addressed to all peoples, an invitation to all who have faith in God and faith in human fraternity to unite and work together to advance a culture of mutual respect, tolerance, pluralism, and dialogue. It spoke not primarily in the name of a pope and an imam, but in the name of the poor, the marginalized, the downtrodden, the refugees, the victims, and it highlighted situations of injustice and exploitation and discrimination. And, of course, it called for promotion of peace, freedom, justice, acceptance of others, full citizenship, and human rights. If the Christians and the churches of the region of the Middle East walk on that road, they are fulfilling their mission. That is precisely what I had in mind when I said that Christians must be able and willing to participate in the battle for the soul of Islam. Assuming, of course, that we remain true to the soul of Christianity. For it must be clear to us, Christians and churches, that this is a mission to be accomplished with love and goodwill towards others, but also with the profoundest humility and constant self-examination. Our future as Christians in that region is bound to our faithfulness to this mission. And so we must organize our lives our work, our churches, uh, our work as churches, our task of theological education in a seminary like ours nest along these lines. And this is what we have been doing at nest in our own humble way by giving a prominent place to the study and teaching of Islam and Christian Muslim relations and requiring that of almost every student in any degree program, and by fostering 
and strengthening Christian-Muslim personal relations with scholars and religious leaders, as well as with institutions. By our forum of interreligious dialogue, which also sponsors and facilitates Muslim, Muslim dialogue. Here's a dialogue between Muslims, Shiites and Sunnis hosted by us and also by our publications. We have a series of books on dialogue of truth for life together, basically the results of all our discussions and papers and lectures on Christian Muslim dialogue. My point and our hope is that this task, this mission, be cultivated and intensified not only on the level of theological education, but also in terms of the role of the churches in society. Thank you. Dr. Saber is willing to take some follow-up questions to his um, excellent keynote address this evening. Um, we can take uh, questions from the room in person and from online in the chat. in the room to begin with, uh, Professor, Professor Daniels. My question is um, about how the Christian community in Lebanon may be being reconstructed by either Syrian immigrants who are Christians who might be bringing, um, becoming as Christians, but then also Christians in Lebanon who might be relocating because of the political situation. Um. Uh, uh, Syrian refugees who are Christian, uh, who, Syrian Christians who have left Syria, uh, some have come to Lebanon, but uh, 1.5 million I'm talking about are mostly, uh, are 99% are Muslim. Uh, the Syrian Christians have either uh, uh, used Lebanon simply as a point of departure to immigrate somewhere else. So we don't really have a big community of uh, Syrian Christian refugees. So they're not really affecting the churches in, in that sense. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions in the room? Professor Mark Swanson. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Sabra, for this really moving presentation. You've spoken several times about the churches of Lebanon. And, well, we all know that uh, this is a very complex uh, community of, of churches in Lebanon. I'm wondering if you would comment on, say, the particular... When we think about the mission of the churches, are there particular charisms right now that the different churches bring to this mission? or diff, uh, specific roles. You gave us the example of the Vatican Statement, um, and then of course there's the work of your seminary, and these are different kinds of things. Uh, but would you like to say anything else about the various churches and the various contributions that they make? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, there are uh, initiatives and there are activities uh, in the Orthodox Church and definitely in the Maronite Church, which continues in the Vatican line, um, uh, in, in, in building bridges uh, and fostering dialogue. And, uh, but uh, most of the churches now are really engaged in 
the humanitarian task. So uh, my point is, not, is that we're not really, uh, I understand we have to survive and everybody has to survive, but not enough is being done on, on the other front, which is the really decisive one for the future. But they're so busy with relief work, and they're doing a great job, but uh, seems to be, uh, if one may offer a little criticism, that uh, this has become uh, the one and only task for the big churches. To read in a question from the chat space. This is an anonymous question. Seeing how most people in the U.S. do not have experience with interreligious conflict nor understanding, which has been a reality in Lebanon for many centuries, what are some things that you, the U.S. Need to, citizens maybe need to be careful of before engaging in any activism or study? Engaging in activism or study where and for whom? Uh, I'm not sure I, I understand the question very well. I uh, think in the U.S. I, I can't really address that. Uh. Let me try another one. A question from Ruth Zikowski. Christianity is on the decline in so many countries. How does this impact on your view of the future of Christian and Muslim relations? Yes, yeah, so Christianity is definitely, in terms of numbers and immigration, so on, on the decline in, in most countries in the Middle East, yes. And of course, it, it affects you know, this uh, uh, Christian drain from the region, uh, affects the vitality of the churches and the ability to have people who can um, perform that, that mission that I have been talking about. Is another question in the room? We'll take another from the chat. Professor Sabra, thank you for your presentation. I appreciate your mention of the role of the acceptance of pluralism and the other as the other. What would the role of missionary-oriented Christian societies from the West, in, what is the role uh, of missionary-oriented Christian societies from the West in furthering this intention for cohesion and for a Near East that works for the good of all? Thank you. Missionaries from the West that go to the Middle East? I think the most important thing is for them to work with and through the local Christians and churches so that they really know what the context is and uh, how to deal with uh, this pluralism that is in the Middle East. Uh, question from David Beb Jones. In your Muslim dialogues, is it possible to relate to Hezbollah? To relate? Yes, we, we have, uh, we, we have uh, of, of course we don't deal with a political party, we, but, but we know that Hezbollah has institutions, some of them educational, uh, it's like theological seminaries, and we have had uh, discussions with them uh, very directly and openly, yes. With, with that uh, any, uh, theological or religious uh, intellectual aspect of uh, their, uh, their work, definitely. And some of the things have been published also in these books that we have uh, uh, put out over the years. Uh, another question from the chat. This is from Linda Eastwood, a McCormick community member. She asks, is there still a significant Druze presence in Lebanon? And if so, what is their role in interreligious dialogue? Druze? Yes, there is a significant uh, uh, Druze community and quite active and influential uh, uh, politically. 
there are recent comers to uh, to uh, Christian Muslim dialogue, and uh, but they are part of uh, uh, the, the national committee of uh, dialogue. However, uh, there is one uh, feature about the Druze that uh, makes it a bit more difficult to have dialogue is that they have no uh, theological seminaries, if you want, because the Druze religion is mostly not open for everybody. It is, there are secret teachings there and you have to be an initiated in order to know more. So it, they don't really have uh, uh, religious uh, institutions with which you can dialogue, but there are individuals who take part in, in uh, dialogues. possibilities of increased role or increased dialogue uh, with, uh, with Judaism? The current situation in Lebanon is that although there used to be a uh, vibrant Jewish community in Lebanon in the 1950s and 60s, but uh, due to the Arab-Israeli conflict and the several wars and so on, there is, uh, there is no visible Jewish community in Lebanon today. Uh, no public, uh, vi publicly visible uh, community, no representatives that appear anywhere. Uh, it is estimated that out of 18,000 uh, Jews that used to be uh, in the country in the 1960s, there may be physically uh, less than 200 Jews in Lebanon today. So they are not really part of any uh, public um, forum of dialogue or any public scene of, of, of dialogue or anything at all, socially or politically. Another question uh, from Jesus Martinez. What role does the Holy Spirit play in the dialogue between Christianity and Islam? Well, I'm not sure how to answer for the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we uh, of course, we believe that as Christians, when we are engaged in, in this dialogue, we do it out of our faith and out of our uh, invocation of the Spirit and we do it in the Christian spirit which is bestowed upon us by the Holy Spirit. But I can't say more about, um, about that. You showed us a picture of the, um, one of the volumes in the dialogue series that you've put out. May I ask about the accessibility of those? Um, well, yeah, uh, they're available at our seminary. We, <laughs> we, we, uh, um, we, we, we basically give them out uh, almost for free. But um, bookshops in Lebanon don't have, uh, don't carry these uh, publications much. So, and they're not available on, online. Um, but we can provide them if people contact us uh, at the Near East School of Theology. Yeah, we, we, these are our publications, but uh, we, I have to admit we are a bit weak on uh, distribution and marketing. I'm sure there are lots of people who would be very, very interested in seeing what you put yeah. together. Uh, so. Yeah, thank you. Of course, they are advertised on our website also, the Nest website. Yeah. Uh, another um, question from Pauline Kaufman. Dr. Sauber, you have introduced us to your close friends from childhood who are Muslim and Druze and talked about how you attended each other's religious important ob observances. It seems to me you have been placed in the middle of the dialogue for a purpose. Can you say more about how this dialogue came about and the role Christians have in the dialogue? 
Yeah, well, uh, the, what, what, uh, what Nest started as a kind of uh, theological dialogue between Muslims and Christians uh, is not something that goes back to me and my, my experience. Uh, yes, I grew up with Muslims in school and uh, I didn't go to a church school. And, uh, but that's not um, really what started uh, the idea at, at Nest. Uh, in fact, Nest has a, has a very long history of uh, Christian-Muslim uh, relations dating back to the 1920s when uh, the School of Theology was really the first in the whole region to begin an objective study of Islam and eventually to start uh, encounters with, with Muslims and then to require it uh, as part of the uh, curriculum. Uh, but uh, the, the distinctive thing about what we do is that we focus mainly on religious and, and theological dialogue r rather than the political or the social or the dialogue of common life, which is done all over the country. And, and sometimes we are part of it, of course. But we focus more on what unites us, what we have in common, and what we differ about in terms of uh, theology and doctrine. Another question from the chat. This comes from Thomas Kramer. Dr. Sabra, you mentioned that Christianity has experienced a similar movement toward pluralism and dialogue. Could you expand on ways that we as Christians can help Islam with this experience? I mean, our, uh, not, not only the whole ecumenical movement, which was a recognition of diversity and pluralism in Christianity, but also what came earlier and what made possible ecumen uh, what made ecumenism possible is this uh, self-examination and self-criticism of Christianity in the modern period. Um, we, ha we have undergone this and we are still in it and, and it has yielded fruit, positive fruit in the ecumenical movement, the inter-Christian uh, dialogue and relations. And I think we have this experience if they ask us to, uh, to if they ask to share, ask us to share this, or want to know about it and see how they can uh, uh, maybe use it uh, in their own um, conflicts with each other and with with others. Uh, we are definitely willing uh, to, to do that. But as I said, it is not our task to go and impose that on them and to tell them you have to do this. But we are ready to, to help if they ask for uh, our experience in that uh, matter. A question from friends in Colorado. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Sabra. What does partnership between churches in Lebanon and churches in the Middle East look like? Is there a form of cooperation among them? Yes, there is, of course, there is, a, there is something called the Middle East Council of Churches, which is a big ecumenical body that brings together all the churches in the Middle East. And uh, it has been there since 1974, and it includes the uh, Orthodox, the Protestants, and the Catholics. And there is a whole history of uh, common um, uh, work and uh, agreements and rapprochement, uh, which is still going on un uh, until today. It has really improved the ecumenical scene and the partnership between the churches in the Middle East in a very significant way. How are you doing on the questions, Dr. Sabra? Take a few more. Yes, I'm fine, yeah. Okay. okay. This is from Poulain Makepi. There's a word for dialogue of Christians of different communions, such as ecumenism. Is there an accept accepted term dialogue between different Muslim schools of jurisprudence, for example, between Shia, Sunni, and the different groups under Sunnis, for example? 
they don't use this word actually, especially in Arabic, dialogue or war uh, among themselves. But, uh, and, and there is very little going on uh, officially uh, and, and not in the political sphere uh, between, let's say, Sunnis and Muslim and Shiites and uh, Druze and Alawites and others. Um, and it was a unique thing when a couple of years ago um, we at NEST invited Sunnis and Shiites to talk about their differences and to talk about dialogue. Uh, and our experience is that those who came to uh, address this were very happy that they were given the opportunity to do that because um, political tensions are such in the Middle East and in Lebanon between Sunnis and Shiites that nobody takes the first step because it, would, it might be considered a sign of weakness. Uh, to take the first step and, you know, put your hand out to, to, to shake the other. So they were extremely uh, thankful and, and happy that a third party actually brought them together. Uh, so, I, and I think we have a, we have a role there to, uh, to cultivate. Uh, Pauline, Pauline Kaufman has many questions, as you already know, Dr. Sabra. She asks, though, a, a really important one. We, we understand the difficult politics in Lebanon at present. Is there any role for the church in politics to address injustice, corruption? Oh, yes. I mean, some, some churches, the bigger churches like the Maronite and the Greek Orthodox, some of their representatives are uh, constantly addressing the uh, not so much the political problems as pure politics, but uh, the moral and also the justice issues uh, and the corruption involved. And the Maronite Patriarch has been doing uh, very uh, courageous, uh, very, very, uh, has had a, a big role in uh, criticizing the ruling class for, for injustice and suppression of freedom and corruption and so on. There was one final question, um, uh, just about uh, the NAST itself, the facility, student body, um, classes, um, related in some part to the port blast and to uh, the recovery from that, if you want to speak to those things a little bit. Yeah, the Beirut port explosion of August 4, 20, 20 damaged uh, nest. Nest is a building of eight floors above ground and four below, and uh, almost every floor suffered uh, shattered glass and uh, and uh, uh, doors um, destroyed uh, doors. And uh, it took us quite a while, but we finally managed to uh, repair everything in, in, in the building, and now we are back to uh, normal. Thank you, Dr. Sabra. Unless there thank are you. more questions in the room, I'd just like to thank you again for all that you do for NEST, for coming here and sharing with us and helping us understand a very complicated and horrific picture of our world. Thank you. Thank you.